Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm Michelle Johnson, the event marketing specialist here at Process Maker. We are very excited to be sharing with you the new features that will let you do more with Process Maker Platform. Uh, feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A section and we will uh, get to them or we will answer them at the end. Today's speakers are Jose Maldonado, Senior Director of Product, and Ryan Cooley, our Engineering Manager. So I turn it over to you, Jose. All right, thank you, Michelle. Can, uh, can you guys hear me? I always have a tendency to triple mute myself. No, we can hear you, you're good. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's dive right in because I'm sure, uh, or rather, I hope everyone here is as excited as I am. So, uh, hello and welcome, everyone. I am Jose Maldonado. I'm honored to serve in our product team at Process Maker, and delighted to spend a few minutes with all of you today, going over one of the most exciting releases that our team that our teams have put together. Um, so I'd like to start by sharing how we see the current and future demands of our customers and then touching on what these mean for our product development strategy, leading up to some of the new introductions with this spring release that reflect these learnings. So let's dive right in. <clears throat> All right, so in order to frame how we are seeing the trend in our customers' journeys, and our role in them, I wanna begin by acknowledging just the blistering pace of our industry. I think we've all seen how across, you know, especially in the recent span from pandemic lockdowns to economic uncertainty to the explosion of AI. Uh, so as we reflect on these, on these unprecedented challenges, we've seen that businesses, our clients have faced over the last years. One thing that's become apparent and critical is the role that digital transformation is playing, specifically around key business expectations on, on savings, so strategies for cost reduction or efficiency, for growth, so hitting those growth goals, for transformation, so maybe leveraging a digital footprint for pivoting into new business models and opportunities. So the shift of, to, to digital has, of course, been force accelerated by several years, and companies that have been slow to adopt are, are taking a struggle, whereas businesses that are thriving are those that have embraced digital transformation as a strategic imperative. You know, and then we have the, the big, big elephant in the, in the room where moreover, you know, recent leaps in AI development have been instrumental in helping businesses adapt to changing market conditions. We've all seen how AI has helped improve workflow efficiency by automating repetitive tasks, reducing the need for manual intervention. For instance, AI powered software can automate data entry or invoice processing or other routine tasks, freeing up employees to focus on higher value activities. Uh, overall, artificial intelligence has continued to drive innovation and improve business workflows, and this has only exploded over the last year. And so as businesses continue to adapt to a changing environment, AI will undoubtedly play an increasingly critical role in helping organizations stay competitive and succeed in the years to come. Eventually, AI will become a benevolent and all-powerful force watching over humanity with unblinking... Wait a minute. Wait. Let me, let me double check my notes here. What is this? Uh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have asked ChatGPT to write my intro speech on the advancement of AI in the post-pandemic workplace. Um, it is onto something, but I'm not sure it's fooling anyone with its lack of self-awareness. So in any case, it is a very interesting time. We're all trying to figure out what exactly these breakthroughs mean for our jobs, our businesses. Uh, and this, these are exciting not just to watch unfold, but also to play an active role in as companies are racing to outperform peers and serving their markets and are in their own automation journeys, figuring out how to leverage these tools and assets in, in practical cost effective ways. And that's where Process Maker comes in. We are extremely proud of having been a key partner in our customers' digital transformation journeys for over two decades. Here we're seeing a brief overview of our release history, um, specific launches in blue above, anchored around a few milestones in green below. So after a few early startup years, you know, bottom left, 
um, you know, we were trying to improve paper-based approvals and whatnot. Our, our first milestone release came as an open source workflow solution. This was adopted by over 1 million users, um, you know, over the, the, the years that followed, leading to a stable series of process automation releases, you know, up to 2015 when we launched the version that was to become one of our most widely internationally adopted enterprise BPM uh, releases. That trend continued up until uh, 2020, when uh, I personally had the honor to host a very similar webinar to this one. So that's why this feels kind of a homecoming for me. Um, when we launched the version that was a complete re-architecture for, for the future, and that evolved our enterprise workflow software into a low-code automation platform. So this, of course, offered us more growth and investing, which led to our to the release of Process Maker IDP or Intelligent Document Processing. This uh, was the result, of course, of acquiring an amazing tech company that has the right mix of AI tools uh, built around ingesting and understanding uh, documents that feed so naturally into our business workflows. Uh, and then finally, last month, we launched an amazing consolidated version of all these products into the, the unified automation solution that is PM Platform, a, a single stop shop for the robust workflow features pioneered by our legacy versions, plus uh, including all the modern cloud first low code tools of more recent developments, as well as the smart document capabilities of IDP. And it's all bundled into a single cohesive um, platform offering. And this journey, of course, leads us to today. Starting this month, we are transitioning into more predictable feature-packed releases delivered every three months, as well as regular monthly improvements up, uh, improvement updates. And we're kicking this off uh, today with uh, the release of Spring, which is out right now. So let's talk about uh, Spring release. Well, <clears throat> in order for me to describe what the, our offering looks like currently, um, we're going to frame it under the overall compound market that currently analysts describe as hyper automation. So this, of course, has been in constant reinvention for as long as Process Maker has been in business, swapping buzzwords every now and then, but always referring to and aggregating the distinct yet related collective of tools, solutions, technologies designed to solve some slice of business automation. And it works well to characterize properly the state of our platform. So this is what high piper uh, automation uh, looks like at Process Maker, going from fringe features into the core of our offering. So there are a number of key automation capabilities for which there are vendors. Um, with it makes sense for us to partner and offer joint integrated solutions. And one of the most common examples of this has been RPA or robotic process automation, which is a natural cousin to workflow automation. Um, then there are the more strategic capabilities for which we are invested in delivering our own full featured offerings. So examples like form, uh, form and screen design, process modeling, doc processing, and management. These are our, but, but a few examples of these, um, and you'll find them all, of course, included in our platform. And these, of course, also evolve over time and are eventually replaced by better, faster versions of themselves, and we're always on the lookout for product innovations um, internally and externally around them. But at the core of our offering lies the orchestration, and this is our true heartbeat. This is the capability of bringing all these capabilities together, our own, those of our partners, and those externally driven by integrated third-party systems into a unified choreographed composition that ensures that every piece plays its part in service of the business. And so when we think about roadmap and we study how our customers evolve and the maturity of how they require and desire automation capabilities, we're always doing so through the lens of those hyper automation offerings, particularly as they map to an automation uh, maturity model, if you will. So businesses who will, for example, start automating a point process and grow into additional workflow applications with the right scale will benefit from document processing automation. Perhaps many of their processes involve passing documents around, understanding what they include, ensuring that they meet certain criteria. And then from there, businesses may also evolve into automating decision-making, 
So growing out of brittle manual policy enforcement, perhaps into um, into large scale automated decision management approvals, intelligence escalations, and so on. Um, for that, from there, the need might, for example, be in analytics, where it becomes imperative to understand trends, gaps, opportunities on how users, customers, and employees are actually driving value from these automations. These are just examples of different milestones in the automation journey. Um, but of course, the new kid on the block is artificial intelligence, uh, as we saw threatening to replace us all. But in the meantime, uh, legitimately offering palpable opportunities for true disruption if it's leveraged appropriately and in line with you know, larger automation strategy as a whole. And so finally, let's do take a minute to just talk a little bit about the practical AI applications on this hyper automation landscape that we've been describing. And so first off, we believe that these offerings um, AI in, in this context, uh, these offerings are aligned across a spectrum of what we understand as intent. This is the concept of, uh, you know, the driver behind the customer's job to be done, right? The concept that tries to capture the problem a customer or a user is trying to solve and the circumstances that surround it. So this spectrum can go from being descriptive, you know, the whole tell me what to do approach, or ever more increasingly to, to be more prescriptive. So it's, it switches to don't tell me what to do, but tell me what you want. And so capabilities that offer different versions of how to understand and represent this intent are at the heart of true um, AI. So for many of us, it started with the capabilities of manually coding a solution you know, uh, empowering developers to extend solutions. Um, and that's why we still, to this day, have a strong technical foundation with support for, for example, multi-language scripting or, you know, flexible data connectors for integration requirements. Now, so that still functions, but then uh, the, the maturity evolved to support and enable what, uh, what is so-called citizen developers. So expanding the monopoly of solution design from a technical audience and into end business uh, users which, with actual subject matter expertise who can leverage authoring tools built specific, specifically for them. So features like uh, the process modeler or versions of business rules engines, decision approval tables, these are all examples of this level of intent automation. And then we start to get, of course, into the more exciting innovations recently about how to manifest intent so that the tool can serve us. So assisted AI um, can offer, for example, product rec recommendations based on usage patterns, or it can translate natural language questions into data analytics search queries to hone quickly into a specific piece of insight. And then this is evolving all the way into generative AI, which is basically understanding intent to the level of being able to self-create solution assets based on that understanding. So, you know, auto-generating process maps or forms out of an intent um, declaration. And so, of course, in this context, Process Maker has been researching AI applications as a key platform offering for, for a long time. Um, and that's another reason why this particular spring release marks a big milestone for us. This is the first of many seasonal releases actively transitioning into more prescriptive intent with a first batch of AI features. So talking about, uh, about features and uh, our spring release, let me introduce to you Ryan Cooley, our engineering manager for PM Platform, to walk us through some of these cool new headliner features you'll all be able to enjoy as of right now. Ryan? Awesome, thank you so much, Jose. Um, our product and engineering teams have been hard at work over the last quarter and we couldn't be more excited uh, about this release. As Jose said, this is the first of many seasonal releases to come. Uh, some of our awesome new features, uh, if we look at the next slide, include process templates, AI global search, decision tables, and dependent lists. We're also introducing enhancements to your experience when using the platform, such as autosave, improvements to modeler, dynamic menu enhancements, and a bunch of under-the-hood improvements. So without further ado, let's dive into more detail, starting with process templates. Process templates allow you to package everything that makes your process work, including scripts, screens, and data connectors. This will allow for faster and easier new process creation. First, you'll be able to get a head start by choosing from a curated selection of predefined templates when you open the process modeler. 
Second, you can save any process of your own to use as a starting point in the future. This will be great for process designers that want to speed adoption of process automation within your own company. It allows less technical users to adapt your process templates to their specific needs. Third, you can import and export templates from your process maker instance to share with others. This is going to spark a really vibrant ecosystem of processes that can be shared with anyone and help speed up your digital transformation. On that note, we've created a template gallery, which you can visit right now at processmaker.com. This gives you access to processes created by our experts in fields such as accounting, banking, customer success, higher education, human resources, and many more. We really can't wait to see what you build with this feature. Next up is AI Global Search. This is the first in a series of game-changing features powered by Process Maker AI. This innovative tool is designed to significantly optimize your efficiency and productivity. By leveraging advanced AI technology, you can easily perform complex searches without having to learn a complex query language. Find the processes, tasks, and requests that you need, leveraging the power of our query language PMQL without having to learn PMQL. This will enable everyone to use our pow powerful reporting features to find the information you need as quickly as possible. Next up, let's talk about decision tables. Imagine being able to incorporate complex decisions into your processes in half the usual time. How do we achieve this? By providing you with a simple, flexible way to handle multiple decision options. And the best part is this can all be done outside of your process flow, eliminating the need for intricate scripting. We've taken complexity and transformed it into simplicity, making your job a lot easier. We've designed decision tables to not be just efficient, but also transparent. They allow you to easily view, understand, and represent business rules in your processes. This means you can quickly visualize and iterate and communicate these rules with your team, with your clients, with stakeholders, and ensure that everyone is on the same page. In short, our decision tables are about offering you greater control and clarity in managing your business processes. They're about making your life easier, your decisions smarter, and your processes much more efficient. Next up, dependent lists. This innovative tool is here to revolutionize the way you use drop-down menus from Screen Builder. You can now use collections as a data source and filter them based on other fields present on the screen. This filtering is also powered by Process Maker AI. This allows you to distill complex queries into simple, natural language. This means your end users will experience a much smoother, more intuitive selection process as they navigate their forms. In summary, dependent select lists bring a new level of intelligence and ease of use to your screen builder experience. Next up is autosave. This will bring a huge sigh of relief to anyone who's ever lost their work due to unexpected interruptions. Uh, I think we all have been there. How many times have you been in the middle of designing a process, a screen, or a script only to lose your progress? And this is why we've implemented this feature. With autosave, you can continue working on your processes, screens, or scripts without any fear of losing your work. No matter if it's been a few minutes, a few hours since your last save, autosave has got your back. It ensures that your work is continuously saved, giving you peace of mind and allowing you to focus on what's most important, which is the task at hand. But if you make some changes and then decide you don't wanna keep them, no worries. When you're ready to share your changes, just hit publish. If you change your mind, you can discard the draft and revert to the previously published version. It's very simple. Speaking of simplicity, let's take a look at Modeler. This release, we have focused on enhancing the usability of our Modeler, making it more intuitive and convenient for you to use. Uh, one major advancement is our keyboard accessibility. Creating new processes and iterating quickly has never been easier. With a range of handy keyboard shortcuts at your fingertips, you can zoom in, pan around, copy and paste elements with ease and speed. You can also now select elements and groups and clone them, and this will speed up your iteration. Next up, dynamic menu enhancements. Our robust UI options have always put you in the driver's seat when it comes to customizing your user experience for different subsets of users. Um, as an admin or solutions designer, we understand the importance of customization. You need to adapt the user interface to align with your specific requirements. This is where our dynamic menu enhancements in spring release 2023 come in. They offer you the ability to customize the sidebar navigation, navigational breadcrumbs, the request button, drop-down menus, and a lot more. These enhancements aren't just about improving the look and feel of the UI, they're really about empowering you to create an interface that truly works for you and your team. 
Speaking of empowerment, we've built a number of structural improvements to enhance the performance and build a firm foundation for the future. These improvements will work in the background to ensure a smoother, faster, and more efficient experience for you. One such improvement is the automatic indexing of commonly used fields in safe searches. This means quicker, more efficient search results, giving you, um, saving you time and effort in locating the information that you need. We've also made significant improvements to chart performance. This ensures that you can view, analyze, and interpret your data faster and more accurately. It's all about providing you with the insights you need when you need them. We've also made a number of speed enhancements to our core platform to ensure faster processing times. We've also integrated a data lake into our system. In the future, this will lead to increased transparency and process automation by giving you a consolidated view of all of your data, making it easier for you to analyze, understand, and make informed decisions. In short, Process Maker Platform Spring 2023 is built on a very solid foundation, and this will lay the groundwork for even more innovation coming in the summer and the fall. Without further ado, I'm gonna hand it back over to Jose to give us a demo of some of these awesome new features. All right, yeah, thanks, Ryan. Let's take a look. So first off, I'm gonna log into this instance that I've teed up here specifically because you'll notice it has a number of requests and tasks and processes that you know, are in different stages. And this allows me to showcase our first highlight uh, headliner feature, which is our global AI search bar. So right up here, top uh, right corner, you'll find the natural language search bar, which basically receives uh, just any natural text to drive your queries. And it's going to understand that and turn that into PMQL, which is our own internal query language that we use to structure um, all the filtering and views. And this will work across your processes, requests, and tasks, and everything that you're looking for. So let's start by something pretty basic. Let's say I want to list all processes. And it's just going to go and figure out that what I'm asking for is actually a list of all our existing processes. And here you can see all the processes that we have in this instance right now. Um, and it works across different data points. So for instance, we want to see some tasks, uh, maybe, you know, show tasks, but also we can add any filter. So show tasks with insurance, and it's going to figure out within the data model of every task to see if it meets this criteria. And you'll notice here how you're, how you're getting a preview of the PMQL that's driving this query. Sure enough, these are all the different tasks uh, in different statuses regarding um, any you know insurance particular task. Um, and you'll also notice how you know in, in different statuses. So we can go ahead and say, okay, uh, not don't show me all, just show me completed tasks with insurance. Of course, you'll see how it's keeping track of everything that we've recently searched, so we can very quickly toggle and, and see them back. And another thing worth noting is you'll notice a few of these are overdue, others are still open, and we can use those dates to drive further PMQL queries directly with our natural language search. So let's say that we wanted to be something like, um, you know, show me tasks due last week, and we just make a very quick. Um, query based on natural language and it'll figure out what we're trying to fetch and sure enough you'll notice the syntax that it needs to drive and everything from the last seven days until now and then we'll we get a, a sense of, of what that's going to look like um, it also works with participants and assignments so for instance show requests not assigned uh, to this user to admin um, admin being this this user that we're using right now and um, notice how it's figuring out how to interpret that and of course you can mix and match and keep on adding criteria so here are all the tasks for different users um, another uh, example of course you want to see we want to see requests maybe show requests in progress um, about inspection uh, so inspection being maybe a, a category or a keyword that we want to see. And sure enough, here we can see, okay, we've got one, um, one rec request in progress on a process called site safety inspection. So you, we notice how um, this is, if this is working, this is, can be also very useful, for instance, to, you know, maybe you want to put together something about approval. So let's see what we have. So show processes about uh, approval. 
So notice it's going to figure out, oh, what you're really talking about are designer assets. So it's going to navigate away from requests into designer and show me all the processes that have some sort of approval. And here we have blank reviews, committee approvals, um, expense approvals, and so on. So it's very interesting. We'll come back to AI-driven search uh, in, a, in a little while when we see it uh, in an, uh, other practical applications. So I'm going to switch instances here. This is a, a fresh install. You'll notice that uh, this one does not have, <coughs> excuse me, much data. So I'm going to switch to the designer tab, and this allows us, allows me to showcase um, another headliner feature that is templates. So right off the bat, and that's why I'm kind of switching between these two instances to highlight the difference, this instance being fresh does not have any process yet. So we haven't started to build anything really here. Um, but you'll notice templates. That's an, an exciting new introduction for Spring. And what templates does is it has the opportunity for you to take your processes and publish them as templates so that you can then create additional assets based on those blueprints. And what's interesting, of course, is that they can be shared along. They're easy to import export. So when you come here to create a new process, you'll be able to browse through these existing templates. Um, and this allows you to not have to you know, maybe start from scratch. For any of these templates, if you kind of click on them, you can get a preview of what that process map looks like. You get a sense of what they're supposed to do. Um, there's documentation for each. So it really helps us as process designers to not have to start from scratch and maybe take our assets and, and share them uh, somewhere. So for instance, um, let me just pick any process here. Here's a, a site safety inspection. You remember that was one of the tasks that we found in the other instance. Um, so we say, okay, this this might be useful. I want to use this template. Uh, we you know, we can rename it as we want. We can pick um, any category that we're interested in. And and sure enough, it creates all the assets. And notice how um, it's already pre-filled. If we click a task, you'll notice it dragged along all the different building blocks. So the screens or the scripts or data connectors that we're using will, were, were going to become part of the template. So we don't have to start from scratch when we want to use this. All right, the next headliner feature that I want to show real quick is decision tables. <clears throat> so let me switch real over here to a process that we've set up. So decision tables are an entirely new designer asset. So right over here in our in any designer module, if I expand the sidebar, you'll find this new entry, decision tables. Um, at, actually, let me just open it here and we'll come back to this process. So a decision table is basically that, is a table format that allows us to represent business rules. So we have a few examples here. I'm going to open our first one, very simple, for insurance coverage. So let's say that we want to put together a process for uh, travel information. And depending on where you're traveling, we get to decide if you're going to be covered or not. So the way we create a decision table to reflect that is leverage the input and output columns. So you'll notice they're color coded. All our inputs, we can define as many variables as we want. Uh, so for instance, I'm not doing anything here with age. We can delete it in a second. I'll want to show you a couple of examples. But let's. But in this example, you're, well, what we're basically saying is um, every every row is a combination of variables that we're sending to the decision table. And if these variables match the value that we're putting in the table or the expression that we're putting in the table, then the output variables will be updated with any values that we punch in. And we can have as many input variables and output variables as needed. So for instance, let's say that uh, here, we're basically saying no matter your age, if the country uh, that is flagged as a location is uh, the string United States, then we're going to return one as a value for coverage. So we can then use this to analyze and say, oh, yep, you're covered. Any other scenario, um, you're not covered. And, um, and then the second line is basically saying for any other rule, so whatever other country that you're sending me, we're not going to cover you. 
imagine if we wanted to create this business rule directly in our process, right? So, you know, we'd basically collect the travel information, have the gateway and, and evaluate that variable. Is it the United States? Then route to yes. And if not, then route elsewhere. That's pretty straightforward. But as your business rules grow in complexity, managing them in the process map becomes pretty inefficient, right? What if we also wanted to uh, allow for United States and Canada? In this effort here, we're pretty much out of luck. So we'd have to you know, add an, a, a secondary uh, sequence flow out of our gateway. Whereas with our decision table, we can very easily just add a new business rule. So we can say, well, if the country is Canada, then we're also covered. And then just, let me just add a new default, which is, okay, now everything else is not covered. And we could just keep on going and have as many as we need. So let's just keep it in this state, in this st uh, stage, and we'll, we'll use this. I'm going to go ahead and save the table. Now let's try to understand a little bit the process. This process is it's a demo process. It's fairly straightforward. All it's do doing is basically it has a task that collects this information, and then it runs it through the through the decision table. And it's basically a loop in which allows us to kind of play with the table um, without, you, you know, in, uh, loop around the, the table without having to start new requests. So it's easier to test. The way how this works is we have a screen here. Let's just take a look at that screen real quick. And notice we're, we're basically having two visibility driven messages so if we click here in advance if covered equals one then it's going to show that you are covered and if covered equals zero it's going to show that you are not covered um, we can test that real quick so we're going to use the data input the data input preview have a variable covered and then if it's one you are covered and if it's zero we're not covered. All right. So that's going to be pretty easy to help us determine. Um, another thing that you'll notice is we're asking for name, age, and destination. So if we fill this out, we can then use these variables to feed our decision table. So everything that we punch here, of course, is going to become available downstream for our table. Now, the other thing that you might notice is that our decision table is actually expecting a variable called coverage, and it's actually expecting a variable called country. And we are using in our screen a variable called covered and a variable called destination. And this is because we have a capability that when we configure the decision task, we just drag a decision task from the, ta the task control um, uh, menu here at the left. We then add the tables that we want to run. So I just choose that coverage table that we have selected. And we can want, if we want, we can customize the mapping of inbound and out and, and outbound um, variables. So here's where we'll tell it uh, actually what my request calls destination, the table understands as country. And what the table returns as coverage, my request understands as covered. And this kind of mapping allows us to have very rich tables that we can use in multiple processes. And all we have to do is just map the decision table variables with our request variables. So why don't we take it for a spin and hopefully it'll start to make sense. So right now, if you recall, our our process um, allows for uh, for coverage if the destination is the United States or Canada. So let's take it for a spin. I'm going to click on the new request. I'm going to look for demo decision tables and let's actually open it in a separate screen. All right, so I'm Jose, I'm 23 years old, fresh out of college, and my post-college travel is going to be to Canada. So this is going to route against our business to, uh, our decision table. And yep, you are covered. Now, what if I'm not going to Canada? I'm going to, um, I don't know, France. Uh, well, if I'm going to France, I'm not covered. What if I'm going to the United States? Uh, 
all right, well, if we're going to the United States, then we are covered. So you get the idea. It's pretty straightforward. Now, let's just pause here. I'm not going to end the process. I'm just going to, before I send it again, let's just edit that decision table. And here we can see United States and Canada. Let's add another condition. Let's say we do want to support France. Um, that's fine. I'm just going to add a new option here in between. And I'm going to say, okay, let's, let's support France as well. Um, I'm going to save this table and you notice then, oh, sorry. And, and of course, what do we want to output? Let's, uh, let's uh, update the table and you'll notice how easy it is for us to then ma manage these decision, these rules independently from the process. I'm not touching the process. I'm just manipulating this coverage table. So now that we change this, let's go back to our task and let's try France once more. Yep, sure enough, if you're going to France, now you are covered. Now let's tr tr let's try to play with um, some additional components, basically your age. What if um, as long as you're under 25, we will ensure you no matter where you go. Uh, but if you're over 25, then you're only going to be supported in those destinations that we called out, uh, France, Canada, and the United States. So again, imagine if we were modeling these rules directly within the, bro the business map. It would grow just so unwieldy. Here, I'm just going to come in here and say, okay, so this is, so here's, here's, uh, here's the three countries that we support. And that's why we have also this age component here. However, notice that it's uh, cast as a, it's expected to be a string. So I'm going to click here to say it's not a string, it's going to be a number. And this allows us to do um, numerical expressions. So I can, we can do some things of the effect of, okay, if age is under 25, and then that's what the dash is for is to basically say, regardless the value for location, we are also going to approve. So I'm going to add an approval here, and then we just leave our, leave our default for any other scenario, uh, coverage is zero. So, so what basically what we're saying is regardless of age, if the location is either United States, Canada, or France, then you are covered. And, or rather, if you happen to be under 25, regardless of location, you're, you're also covered. Um, you can already imagine how how unwieldy it would be to map this kind of condition, these kinds of conditions directly on the process. And here it's just a matter of of um, mapping out these options. So I'm going to go ahead and save. And so now let's uh, let's play with this a little bit. So what we'd be saying is, well, if you're if you're 30 years old and you're trying to go to France, well, that's a non-issue because France is one of our covered countries. Perfect. But what if you're trying to to go to Germany? Well, if you're 30 years old and you're trying to go to Germany, you're out of luck. You're not covered. Well, what if you're not 30, but you're actually 24? In that case, the student uh, uh, coverage kicks in. And sure enough, you are covered. Um, in fact, we could try just one more thing real quick. I'm going to um, come to this screen here and Let's add a, let's add a, uh, or not here, here in the, you are not covered. Let's add a, um, a coverage response, right? This, um, we're, let's add a new variable for coverage response. So I'm going to go ahead and publish it so it becomes part of what we're showing. And then I'm going to edit the table and I'm going to add a new variable. So the label we put whatever we want. What is the variable that we're declaring? Well, we're, we're declaring a variable calling it coverage response. And then this allows us to um, to add any sort of message that we want. Um, and in fact, it looks like it's also going to be more useful uh, if we if we use it uh, when you're also covered. So I'm going to go ahead and let's just add this to this piece here as well. All right. And, and then 
we just declare what we want this to read. So for instance, if it's United States, we can say, um, this is one of our default destinations. And then if it's uh, Canada, we can say um, Canada is also supported. If it's France, we can also do mm, this is our primary European location. And, you know, student coverage covers this trip because you're under 25. And for everyone else, um, this travel cannot be insured. All right, so let's go ahead and save this. Now what I'm doing is I'm sending in, as an output, an additional message, and we can customize this as much as we want. Now since we added this message to the screen, then let's try that again. All right, and there we see it. Student coverage covers this trip. Um, if we were to replace this for Canada, You can see that Canada is also supported. And this also lets just let us know that even if the student coverage um, option would be valid, the first rule that picked up this approval was actually the Canadian one, because that's just happened first on the table. All right. So, so so far, that's how decision tables work. They're extremely useful to collect uh, rich, um, rich uh, business rules. Let's try one more. Let's uh, put you out, out of coverage. I'm going to add 29, and let's add a different country that is unsupported. So let's try with Brazil. And sure enough, this travel cannot be insured. So makes perfect sense, and it, it, it's a great way to uh, tie all these things together. Now I want to show you uh, one last couple of things, which is how can we better map this destination so that we don't have to keep typing it. Uh, and this is a great opportunity to show us to show uh, to, for me to show you one of our um, also super interesting additions, which are collection based drop downs. And so what I went ahead and, and, and did was uh, I have this list here of locations that I just pulled off of a uh, of a flat file off the internet. You can see this is just a list of cities and countries and so on. And I want to use this list to actually populate a series of dropdowns for this destination so that you know our customers don't have to type it. And this is an extremely common use case. So let's put this together real quick. So what I'm gonna do is, um, let's, let's, uh, let's pause here. So I'm gonna, let's, let's just stop this run. And I'm going to come over here to the uh, admin, and we're going to upload that list into a collection because that will allow us to to just feed it into uh, our form. So I'm going to create a new collection, and I'm going to call this destinations, destinations, and I already have a couple of screens here to make this quick. Uh, view location or. Uh, I don't even know what I have here. I'm not sure, it's for this purpose. Um, all right. All right. So I have our, our um, I have our, a, new, a fresh new collection, and of course, if I wanted to just create it, you know, I could just be adding countries and cities. But I don't want to create it manually. That's what I have that list for. So let's just come back real quick. And you can see here we can import a flat file. So I'm just going to go ahead and drag that flat file of cities and tables. Let's just double check. Yep, that's the one. Open. Okay, so I get to map. So our first column is for country. So I'm going to call this, I'm going to select country and city. And we don't need more values there. All right. First row contains columns. Awesome. Import. And sure enough, we have here 400 and such cities. Um, in fact, we can configure this real quick. Let's just add these to see what we've got. Country and city. Save. 
now when we check up destinations, there we are. So, all right, pretty interesting. All right, so now I want to pull from this collection into our process, into our form. What does that look like? So let's come back to our, um, to our screen builder here and we have our destination uh, line input. So actually I'm gonna get rid of this because what we want to do is replace it with a uh, series of drop downs. So I'm gonna delete this and let's add a, a new uh, select list. And this is gonna be called uh, also the destination. And here we can, you know, select, uh, actually we're gonna do select country um, because we, we also want to pick a city in a second. And now the way that this is gonna work is to, we have to just add a data source for it. So if you're familiar with Process Maker, you'll, uh, you will know that, that currently the way to feed from collections is using the data connector uh, data source. But this, of course, involves knowing uh, how to configure it, how to configure the response variable, the value and the content, and then finding the right data connector. And it's, it, it's possible, but it's not necessarily straightforward. Very useful when you want to tweak the data connectors to pull the right set of data. But for this purpose, where we just want to pull from a collection, um, there is now a much easier way. So we are introducing collection-driven dropdowns. We have a new data source for a collection. I'm just going to select that. And it very clearly asks me, well, what collection do you want to use? And here are all the collections that we have. And here's this destinations that we just created a few minutes ago. And it's going to ask, OK, what do you want to use for label? And what do you want to use for value? Label is one that's going to read on screen, so I want the country. And value, I also want the whatever we're reading on screen. Um, and that's it. Let's just go back to our um, to our preview and let's check that out. Select country, and sure enough, here's our list. And of course, you'll notice, of course, how it's got a lot of duplicate values or repeated values, Canada, Canada, Brazil, Brazil, because if you remember our original table i'm just showing it you here you'll notice that since this table is actually reading cities then of course the country value is duplicated see here that's why that's why it's behaving this way so of course in a in a proper data model you know you'd create different distinct collections for countries and distinct for cities and you so you manage this but that's not certainly your only option now, if you come back to the designer, you notice that we have an option to ignore duplicates in this list. So I'm just going to go ahead and check that box. And just by doing so, in a couple of clicks, uh, all of a sudden, we can very simply just come over here and you'll notice we, we only see them once. And, you know, sure, sure enough, there's uh, what we want to do. Now, let's just say that, you know, we also want to create uh, another selection for, for cities because we saw that our destinations also support that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and let's just duplicate this control, plop it in here, and then this destination, I'm just gonna call it city. And here, select city. And now I'm gonna go to our data source and I'm going to swap the country for the city pretty straightforward so now of course we've get we get two controls one for uh one for country and the other for city but of course you'll also notice that it's just showing every city right it's not sensitive to my changes in in uh in country of course we need to link these two together so you you um you know currently it's not an easy straightforward way to solve this use case, a very common use case. And so now I'm very excited to introduce how collection dropdowns support a new way to link them using um, our PMQL advanced data search. And what's interesting is that this data search also supports the same AI engine that's using our global search that we saw earlier today. So basically now we just need to tell the engine, you know, uh, what what is the exact filter uh, uh, or criteria that we're using to, to select conditionally from that list. Basically, what we need to say is, well, don't show me every city, right? Just show me those cities um, whose country matches whatever I chose here as destination. Um, and we can be pretty literal. So I'm just going to go a little crazy, and I'm going to say uh, here on the, on, the, on the data search, I'm going to say, you know, 
don't try don't bring everything you know just you know show uh, only where destinate where a uh, country matches destination and sure enough this is the right PMQL but we don't care about that I'm just going to come in here and now if I pick a country we already had Germany pre-selected so let's see what the city is showing and sure enough it's showing me just um, German cities if I want to visit a different country say uh, Chile it's going to show me only Chilean cities and you know this this works across the board if I even type ahead and select the United States you notice how it updated to uh, US cities all this driven by this query that I didn't need to know the syntax for you know data dot or the mustache I just type whatever I'm interested in but Let, let's try that again I'm just going to delete this query and if I delete the query then once more we're seeing every city even if we have Germany selected we're see we're seeing every city so I'm just going to go and say you know uh, don't show all cities exclamation mark and yeah I'm just being e extreme with our natural language um, just those where country matches destination country of course is this variable here that's in the collection and destination is the the value of that so i'm just going to hook, click enter you notice the pmql at work and it's going to try to interpret it, it to interpret the correct syntax and sure enough destination of course being the selected country sure enough now if we come back still have germany selected now it's just german cities so in this fashion we can of course um very easily drive you know additional um additional um functionality very rich uh very rich lookups and dependent drop downs straight from our collections so this is looking great i'm going to publish it so this becomes the version active in our process and then uh let's try that again let's spin up a new uh decision table and let's take it for one final spin so I'm Jose and let's say I'm age 30 and I'm going to travel to um, shore the United States so I'm seeing just US cities I want to go to LA send for review no problem this is one of our default destinations I made a typo there <laughs> let's, uh, uh, in our decision table yep just wanted to make sure that we're consistent might as well s s fix that right uh, right away uh, awesome what if um, I'm not going to the United States I'm actually going to the United Kingdom notice how the city is then wiped because it's no longer matches that criteria now instead I want to go to Liverpool Oh, sorry this travel cannot be insured well wait a minute I'm, I'm not actually 30 years old I'm just 23 years old let's try that oh in that case then student coverage covers this trip awesome so this has been a, a very high level overview of some of the coolest headliner features that come in on spring remember this is out first week of May so very excited to share uh, to share this with you all Awesome, awesome stuff. Thank you, Jose. A really cool demo. And we see that uh, we do have some Q&As. We've been answering some of them uh, via text already. So if you do submit any more, we will try to answer them as quickly as we can. Jose, do you want to answer any of these questions live? Yeah, let me go. Let me go quick down this this um, this list. Um, I'm happy to see that a lot of these have to do with uh, decision tables, and we'll try to cover them. You know, as, again, as fast as, as we can. But you'll also invite everyone to, you know, play with them. Um, yes, we do support uh, feel in the decision tables. Um, also, in our release notes, you will find um, you will find um, 
just further detail and the release notes are linked on our website uh, first thing you'll see at the banner there um, so yes you'll you can use feel in your decision tables um, another thing about the decision table so you can uh, you can update a, a number of different variables uh, on decision on on every uh, on every run so how to specifically use it for your context you know there, there are different ways to, to look at it but um, uh, you know, I, I invite you to, to play with this and get more more instance. Um, what other notes are in here? So there are a couple of questions about how these uh, updates relate to uh, Aleutian workflow customers. And um, it's a great question. Of course, we're very in lockstep with um, our, our Aleutian friends. So certainly we're working very closely with them to ensure that we can bring to to that uh, version, um, all the benefits that we're discussing here. Um, so, you know, just stay in the loop of what, what that means specifically for, for that target uh, audience. But let's see, if you leave the decision is blank, what happens? Um, I'm not sure, <laughs> nothing. That's basically means to, to skip the, the rule. So sure, nothing happens. <laughs> Um, outputting outputting decision tables to a variable rather than a static value. Well, the idea is that you that you the, you declare in the table enough to drive the rule, and then you can read the the output out, off of that to then manipulate it downstream. Um, in in subsequent releases, we plan to you know increase that with you know better mustache support. But we're, right now, we're just leveraging how to enforce the the rules strictly. Um, can decision tables be referenced in scripts or watchers or only through the process design element? Um, that is a good question. We can follow up on that. Um, the, the initial use case is to be driven for the process model, but of course you can, um, you know, you can execute the, the model uh, flow via an API call, so it will tie back certainly for scripts and, and watchers. Um, maybe you just haven't surfaced uh, the, the UX for, for some of these use cases. It is designed for you to use it uh, from the process map, yeah. All right, I think we've answered everyone's question. And please, let's not limit, limit it here. Feel free to reach us uh, through several channels and we'll happily keep the conversations going, but I'll, I'll pass it off to, to Michelle to kind of wrap us up and point us into next steps. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Jose and Ryan. Today was, was great. Uh, well, that's a wrap, everyone. So on behalf of myself and our process maker team, I'd like to thank you all so much for attending today. Uh, we will be sending out the recording um, of today's webinar and, and the event you weren't able to join us for the full hour. Uh, if there are any additional questions, you can send them to us at marketing at processmaker.com, and I will make sure uh, that we get them answered for you. Well, we hope to see you in three months for our summer release. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great day.